So the Sunday before Ash Wednesday, in the beginning of Lent, is Transfiguration Sunday. And each year the focus is on this story that we'll hear today from Luke's Gospel of Jesus' moment on the mountaintop with the disciples and Moses and Elijah. Hear then God's word from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but when they awoke, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men beside him. And just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while Peter was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice, and it said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And the disciples kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. No one likes being woken in the middle of the night by a ringing telephone. All right? Think about a time when this has happened in your own life. You're in a sound slumber, and the phone by the bed, whether a landline or a cell phone, suddenly goes off. You roll over and you squint at the clock and then groan at the early hour of the morning. And then you try to pull yourself together to sound coherent when you answer the phone. Now granted, sometimes it was actually good news. I remember there were days when the Pittsburgh School District had an automated phone message system that would call your house around 5 in the morning if schools were canceled for a snow day. Getting those phone calls were always very welcome, especially by the younger members of our household. But other times in the middle of the night, a phone call is not welcome. It invariably means bad news perhaps a death, an accident, or an emergency. And in both cases, whether good or bad, the hardest part is simply trying to clear the fog from your mind long enough to comprehend what's being said to you by the other person on the phone. All right, sermon paragraph number two. Let's focus on just the phone call for a moment. Again, you're sound asleep, the phone starts ringing, and you answer it by saying, hello. Now, you try to sound alert and professional, but it's probably obvious that you were awakened abruptly. And so what does the person on the other end of the phone almost always say to you in that moment? I'm sorry, did I wake you? Now, no one wants to admit that, and so invariably we will say, no, no, I, I was awake, I just hadn't spoken much yet. Or, no, I was awake, uh, I just have a sore throat. And then we'll say, after those opening fibs, uh, what can I do for you? And again, we spend those moments trying to shake the fog from our brains, and we try to concentrate of what this person is telling us and what it means for us. Paragraph number three. I want us to come at this topic again from a slightly different angle. Several times in the Bible, people were awoken from a very deep sleep or received information while they were sleeping through dreams. It happened, well, not just several times, frankly, it happened 21 times in the Bible. It happens 15 times in the Old Testament and six times in the New Testament. Some of the most famous dreams are the time when Jacob 
fell asleep with his head on a rock and had a vision of a ladder reaching up to heaven with angels going up and down on it and God promising in a voice to him that all the land upon which he could see would belong to him. The other famous dream comes in Matthew's gospel. When Joseph is told in the dream not to divorce Mary, his betrothed, but to take her as his wife because the child she carries is from the Holy Spirit. Now, imagine having one of those dreams yourself and then waking up trying to make sense as your brain is still in a fog and you're getting accustomed to the fact that you're awake. You look around the room even as the images from the dream are still present to you and even the voices, the words you heard in your sleep are still ringing in your ears. In that moment, you may tell yourself, it was just a dream, but it felt so real. In that moment, you're standing with your feet straddling two different worlds, the world of your senses and the world that transcends your senses. Paragraph four. As people of faith, all of us live in the thin space between the world of our senses and the world of the spirit. We live in, in the this world of, of people and things and what we gather through our senses, but we believe in a God who transcends this world, a God revealed in Jesus Christ, this man of Nazareth, yet this crucified, resurrected, and ascended Son of God. Now, we gather in church, we talk about this all the time, but the whole topic, in many ways, is incredibly difficult to put into words. And believe me, I know how hard it is every week to put this into words. It involves lived life and felt faith. It involves things seen, and things invisible to the eyes. But it occurred to me that actually a good way to appreciate the heaven and earth tension of all faith language is actually right here in this story of the transfiguration. Jesus has just taught a huge crowd and then fed them from a small, meager offering of a few loaves and fish. After that meal, Jesus gathered with his disciples and he tells them for the first time that the Son of Man is going to be rejected and abused and crucified and killed, but on the third day he would rise again. As if all of that, that miracle and that passion prediction weren't too much to try and consider and understand, in a few days, Jesus now is going to take three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to the top of a mountain. Now, the disciples are exhausted. They're worn out. And so while Jesus is praying, they fall asleep. But at some point, they're roused from their slumber, admittedly not with a cell phone, but in something is before them that they couldn't grasp when they opened their eyes. What they saw is now Jesus transfigured in dazzling clothes, standing and talking with Moses and Elijah. In that moment, there's no time to sort this out, to ask what's going on. And the entire experience is without any parallel in their own life. It is by definition an epiphany, an inbreaking that's unique of God's glory into the human realm. And this is not something you or I can easily describe, but it feels a little bit like when someone wakes from a dream and in that moment senses a convergence of the ways of heaven and the ways of earth. Now in the story, we're next told that Peter, just like that person trying to sound alert when the phone rings at two in the morning, pops up and says, Rabbi, good thing that we're here so we can put up tents for you, Jesus, and for your two honored guests. But Peter's confident voice doesn't fool anyone. Scripture itself even goes so far as to say he didn't know what he was saying. But if the mental fog wasn't enough in that moment, 
a literal fog, a cloud, descends upon the entire group. It's a cloud reminiscent of the time when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and spoke with God. And out of this fog, out of this cloud, a voice says clearly, this, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Now, none of this is meant to be easily explained. All of this is about something bigger than words. Because it's all about transcendence. It's about ultimate things, divinity, holiness, eternity. It's not about human reason. It's about human awe. So the question is, what do we do with this story of the transfiguration? Like Peter, we might find ourselves shaking our heads a bit, trying to sort it all out as if woken from a sound sleep. But we're still confronted with a description that is beyond our experiences. And then it ends with this commandment to listen to Christ. As a preacher, I'd be doing you a disservice if my next choice was simply to tame down this story. Because I could say to you, look, this story's about a mountaintop experience. You've all had mountaintop experiences. They're great, but you can't stay there. So you need to get up and move down the mountain back to the highways and byways of life. It's going to be messy. It's going to be hard. Jesus himself discovered that that pathway led to a cross. And we too will face hardship. But it's time to shake off your sleep. Don't try to build any booths and follow Jesus on the road of life that leads to eternal life. There's been a lot of sermons that have said just that. But instead of that, today it's actually better that we stand for a moment beside a somewhat sleepy Peter with fog in our brains, smack dab in the middle of this thin place where heaven and earth have come together and recognize that no words will do it justice. The story forces us to stop being so rational for a moment. And it reminds us that the whole point of why you came to church today was to worship a God who is not you. To worship a God who transcends you, who exceeds all of us in every possible way, and before whom the appropriate response is not a tip of our head or a wise nod, but a literal, humble, somewhat foggy sense of awe. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been asked on several occasions, what is the church going to be like when we move out of hopefully our two-year pandemic purgatory? What should the church say and do post-COVID ID? There is some practical advice that I've given. I've noticed that actually I firmly believe we will never go back to the way church was before. We will invariably be doing ministry in hybrid ways, in-person gatherings and remote, sitting in pews and watching on screens from distant locations. And that's not just going to be true for Sunday morning. It's going to be true for all of the ministry, for educational events, for Sunday school classes, for musical programs, for weddings, for funerals, for committee meetings. And it may not be offered for every single thing we do, but by and large, it's going to be a new dynamic in most of what the church does. Secondly, I think we will work on finding new ways to really have fellowship with people in both of these worlds, in person and remote. We will expand ways to connect, whether that's the chat feature on the Zoom bar or on Facebook, or other ways to text and be in communication, so that our faith interactions are not dependent on personal proximity. Now this will be challenging. There's nothing and I can say this as a preacher, there's nothing like having a captive audience in front of you on a Sunday morning. 
There's nothing like having folks that are not going to get up and walk out that door when it's time for the stewardship message or the minute for mission. But the reality is we're going to have to find new ways to connect. Wherever the people are, it's going to be critical for the future church. Third, we will lose some people, and we need to grieve those losses. Once Sunday morning physically in a church becomes optional, some will opt out, and many already have. And that's sad, but it will not define us who we are as a church going forward. Now, having gone through a series of practical points, I realized something else. The church is precisely what the world needs post-COVID. To a world on edge, because of viruses and climate change, they need our language of a God who is omnipotent and eternal, the creator of all life. To a world hell-bent on war and violence and injustice, they need the message of a Savior who endured a cross and a tomb and yet is literally here beside us right now. This Jesus is not our Sunday morning therapist. He is the one who calls us to work for peace, to insist on justice, to call for the healing of the nations. He is the one to whom we're supposed to listen. To a world of greed will be that countercultural force that still passes plates and collects offerings to share with those who have need. And to a world of angry words and conspiracy theories, we're going to be the group that still prays together, that volunteers side by side, that does not take the world's no for a final answer, who always trusts that God's Holy Spirit is in our midst. Now, all of this may feel a bit foggy, like we're coming out of a deep sleep. But we all know that it's true in our hearts. We know that there's more than just this life to life. Because we've felt awe. We've felt forgiveness. We've felt hope and all of which the world desperately needs right now. So the sermon, closing paragraph on Transfiguration Sunday. None of us is expected to fully understand all of this, which is why we are given glimpses strong enough to trouble us, yet powerful enough to change us for the good forever. Visions literally of heaven and of earth. This Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of the resurrection and the ascension. Dazzling light, voices from a cloud, things more real than reality. Every one of you has glimpsed it somewhere. Every one of you has sensed it somehow in your life. At some moment, and you may be hesitant to hold on to it, but it's still there. And it's real. So my advice is don't shake it off. Breathe. Listen to Christ. Walk by faith, not by sight. And then go now. For tomorrow literally depends upon the faith you claim today. In the name of Christ, amen.